Uh, hi, Xiao. Um, thanks for the invitation. Really excited to, to be here. Um, as, as you mentioned, I mean, my background is predominantly sort of semiconductors, mobile phone technology. I spent many years of my academic life trying to shrink things into the size of a mobile phone. And I guess my honeymoon in the sort of medical arena began when we made one of the world's first cochlear implants for born deaf children. And I'm not here to talk about implants, only to say that it was clear that if you apply a fraction of this technology to healthcare, you can make major innovation. So my sort of honeymoon in the medical area began, but I guess what really changed my direction completely was around that same time my son, Marcus, lost his kidneys through a renal genetic predisposition. Now, I'm not here for sympathy. I mean, the, the point really was that I couldn't have prevented it from happening. But if we'd known about it early enough, we could have managed his lifestyle very differently. And that was really, really important, really important. So then we started thinking, well, how can we start to create preventative technology? How can we go for personalized health care? How can we change and demystify the whole genetics area? So I entered into this personalized health care um, arena, if you like, and I tried for years and years and years to get personalized medicine into hospitals, making wearable devices that could monitor your vital signs and discharge you earlier from hospitals. We made genetic tests that could look at sort of drugs, whether or not these drugs could be metabolized. You know, more people die from underdose and overdose of drugs than the disease that they've actually got. So that whole area frustrated me because prevention was never as important as cure. There were never business models for prevention. You know, what is the, the value of spending money on something additional, supplementary, when effectively we've got an ECG monitor, we've got lab tests. So I got very frustrated and thought, look, I need to empower the consumer. I need to democratize DNA testing and I need people to look after their own health. So rather than personalized healthcare, let's make health personal. And that was really my drive for many years. So we wanted to tackle then something that was really epidemic, something that we all knew um, today is one of the biggest sort of chronic disease issues that the world knows, and that is obesity, type two diabetes, hypertension, just in the UK alone, more than 60% of the population are either obese or overweight. And about three and a half to four million people are type two diabetic. Even kids, kids seven years old, are type two diabetic. There used to be a zero after that. It used to be 70 year olds. Now, this is how epidemic that's become. And you'll see where the lead is now to the sort of whole COVID issue and how chronic disease is escalating also the, uh, the if you like, the strength of the COVID virus. So I wanted to get into the consumer world. So we created this cartridge and together with the technology partnership in Cambridge, what we wanted to do was to effectively have an entire lab on a cartridge. We needed to, to sort of tick many boxes. A, we wanted direct sample to result. We didn't want a laboratory. We don't want a lab in a retail environment. B, we wanted the results translated. We don't just want a problem. All these direct-to-consumer tests, they say you've got predispositions to various genetic conditions, but what can you do about them? We needed to translate that into something actionable. And thirdly, privacy. So we needed to dispose of this cartridge after the test so we don't store genetic information. So we set up a shop in Covent Garden. We started to franchise with supermarkets like Waitrose and uh, Sainsbury's and Tesco's. And the whole idea was to create a microchip, a little cartridge effectively. And on this cartridge, we've effectively got this array. And on this array, we've got all these little wells. And in the wells, we're looking at putting the bait, if you like, the primers, the detectors of genetic errors in our whole genome. And for this epidemic, we were looking at genetic predispositions to type two diabetes, to obesity, to hypertension, to cholesterol. These are all nutrition related conditions. 
So if we can then detect whether you've got these particular genes, then effectively we know what the um, relationships are. So effectively, in a cloud, we've got every single macronutrient related to every single product that you can find in all the supermarkets in the UK. And the first step, I've only got three minutes left. <laughs> Gosh, I, I, I know I've got to be quite quick, but, but, but effectively we repurposed the technology. So, so, so you can go into a retail outlet and then you can effectively shop with your DNA. I mean, that was the whole, whole point. And we called the company DNA Nudge because you could go to any food product and you could scan that food product. That product's red for me. There's another product here that's, I scan this product. It's, it should be green for me because I've tested it before. And that's green for me. So it's not saying that you shouldn't eat the peanuts or the crisps or the cereals or the biscuits and eat the bananas instead. But when nudging people to eat healthier, because what's more authoritative than your DNA? Now all this happened pre-COVID. Then COVID came along and we had a technology with a utility that was direct to consumer. So effectively the, the key being if we could repurpose this and then we went into that war zone if you like it was around march april time this year we could then rather than looking at genetic errors for things like the human genome why don't we look at the rna of the virus and it was pretty straightforward in terms of the repurposing because all we had to do was replace the bait if you like the the um, primers for the detection of COVID-19. So we had WHO genes, we had CDC genes, we had Public Health England genes, and we could put all those detectors on our simple uh, array. And as a result, you then take a quick swab. The swab could either be a nasal swab or it could be a, an isohelix, which is a um, different type of swab, which is a swab that either goes into the mouth or into the nasal. In fact, we prefer the saliva and, and the mouth swabs a lot easier. You just do the swab in, you then insert the swab into the cartridge, you pull the sleeve of the, close the orifice, the bung, and then what happens is your DNA or RNA effectively gets sliced, it gets buffered, your RNA then gets extracted through a membrane, and then it gets spread, they're like fish. You need to amplify the fish, the, hum the uh, viral RNA, so it bites the bait. And that process is known as PCR, the famous PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And we do that in something as small as a shoebox. So this is a decentralized technology now. It doesn't need a laboratory. You just close the box and just over an hour, you get the detection whether you've got COVID-19 or not. So in a way, what really then happened was that we went into the field, we went into the um, hospitals. If we go onto the hospital slide here, you see that we, um, next one, next one, Mohammed, next one. <laughs> yeah, next one. So, so, so effectively, around March time, we bulldozed ourselves into the NHS. We didn't care. I got all my postgrads, all my staff. We just went into the thick of it. And we had to validate because democracy and accuracy were really important for us. If we were going to use this out of the lab, we positioned ourselves in A&E wards, in maternity wards, in cancer wards, in elective surgery wards, and in mental health wards. And we just carpet bombed the whole lot, got huge validation and showed that the test was up in the 90s in terms of sensitivity, specificity, we we're getting all the negatives correct. And as a result of that, because of the utility, we convinced the NHS to take this on board. And as a result now, we've just had the order for 5.8 million cartridges to be deployed throughout the UK, Ireland and Scotland. But the story really is that, that effectively it took a pandemic for us to get a technology that's, uh, if you like, prepared for personalized medicine into the hospital system. So the only way that we could bulldoze this was through COVID. And it's unfortunate that it took such a, a chronic, awful pandemic for us to get personalized decentralization into hospitals. Now I'm mopping up the mess that we've left, but that's fine. We produced a great Lancet paper just a week ago that shows all our results and studies. We compared to all the different NHS machines and now we're out there and it's great. You know, you can imagine the utility in, in maternity wards. Mothers can now have a test. They can go and have their C-sections 
only wait in an hour or so rather than 48 hours. And in most cases, they have to separate from their from their babies. Um, A&E wards, we can segregate between red and green now very, very quickly. Elective surgery, we can operate on cancer patients. They only have to wait an hour or so for a result so they can go into operation. And actually, more importantly, in, in mental health, poor mental health patients having to wait 48 hours in isolation. The anxiety, now, just over one and a half hours, they know whether they've got COVID or not. So effectively, you know, the bottom line is that it's taken a pandemic to really, really help an epidemic. And you can see us here in the field, but this is the last slide, just really showing how something that's decentralized and something that goes into the field. And, you know, Louis Pasteur once said in the, in the 19th century that it's the mic it's the microbe that will have the last word but come on guys it's the 21st century surely technology should have the last word and we should be beating this problem so thank you very much